All right. So we're going to start in a second. We're going to allow a few more people uh, to come in. Uh, there's slowly people are starting to join us. That's great. Um, uh, all right. We'll just give it uh, half a minute more and then we'll officially start. Michelle, can you tell us who's on the wall behind you? Oh, this is an embarrassing moment. Well, this is actually my wedding gift for my sister. My sister gave me, she, she works in the art world. At that time she lived in Mexico and she was working in the, in the uh, so this is actually a, a photograph, uh, a painted photograph. I have no idea, but, uh, but I keep it on a hidden corner in the house that happened to be the quietest one. Um, which is where I'm doing my Zoom class. So I typically go like this, so uh -huh. that it looks a little bit more. Right, different. right, right. Thank you so much. All right, so it is 3.01, and we are going to officially start uh, this workshop with the wonderful Winter Miller. Winter is a person I love deeply. It is somebody who um, I consider a friend, uh, a great artist. Uh, we are actually working together. We are working together on a piece for Miami New Drama. Uh, Winter actually came to, to, to work in Miami a few, um, a few months ago. And we know that we'll, we're gonna have Winter very soon, as soon as the theater uh, and seasons are gonna go back to normal, you'll see her show there. Um, Winter is a very unique writer because she, uh, she, she has this great gravitas of understanding the world. Winter worked at the New York Times, uh, and she wrote numerous pieces for the New York Times. Uh, and she's also uh, an extraordinary accomplished playwright. Uh, her uh, play in Darfur played at the Public Theater. Uh, her recent play, No One Is Forgotten, uh, played last summer off Broadway at, at Rattlestick, if, if I'm not. Um, mistaken and it was sold out and, and when you know winter has all, the, all all these great friends sort of from the from the journalism world who all came and supported her she had she had the who is who of uh <laughs> a, you know doing the the talkbacks uh and she's also an activist and she's somebody with strong political uh, ideas and feelings um and so and i agree with most of what winter thinks and then we and so so there's nothing i enjoy more than than than, than talking extensively with winter uh because she, she all of her ideas are extremely well thought out she's not somebody and that translates in her work in her personal feelings in her journalism everything is thought out and and that's why um, it is, you know, as, as now the workshops are getting a little bit more precise, I think the first three workshops were very sort of like a broader view of what, you know, the work of an actor, the work of a director, the work of a playwright, as we are going now deeper into understanding really the craft. I wanted, uh, you know, this first, uh, you know, playwriting workshop to be with Winter and the idea of how you can, you know, why being specific especially when you're trying to talk about very broad and complicated political uh, subjects, why the specificity is important. How can you make uh, the political personal? Um, so uh, without further ado, Madame Wintermiller. Merci, merci. Uh, well, hi people. It's, um, I've never been in an environment where I can't see uh, the people I'm speaking with. So, um, just pretend, pretend you're all smiling. I don't know, give a smile, start off with a smile so we feel like we're really, you know, hey, it's so great to, be, oh, it's great. To, oh, you guys look, oh, you're really- a handsome, handsome crowd, isn't it? Yeah, really handsome crowd, good looking crowd. Uh, and so, yeah, see, I'm getting smile. Oh, you can type your smiles in, yes. Um, I'm totally thrilled to be here. I am just, sort of, I'm currently uh, at a writer's residency in the mountains of California. So my social isolating, uh, I'm gonna show you, uh, it looks like this. Uh, it's just miles of um, mountains, um, which is great for 
Oh, mountaineering. I don't know. Anyway, so it looks like I'm about to pilot a helicopter, um, but there's no helicopter. So everyone relax. Um, what I wanted to do uh, in doing this, this topic, the personal is, uh, ha, ha, ha. the political is personal, the specific is universal. Right now we're in a time where probably all of us are asking, what is it that we do? and why do we do it and does it matter and will it matter in five minutes and will it matter in you know three weeks or a year um the short answer is yes it matters it matters on a day-to-day -day level because it's taking you through your day this is the way that you are surviving this is what you are doing and this is what is giving you some kind of sustenance if the art that you make uh is not giving you sustenance right now then, then take a break from it and look for some other art. Like, honestly, this is not the time to, uh, to suffer. Uh, it's a time to explore. If you can allow it to free you in the sense of, well, maybe there won't be any more plays. So maybe I'll write that 40 character play that takes place on an asteroid uh, and is voiced by, you know, Muppets and um, small children under the age of seven. You know, you could take this as an opportunity to totally expand your horizons and dream big. Instead of writing that two character play that's in a living room, set your play where you want to set it, set it in your mind, whatever it is. Like this is a time to be able to think in a way that you didn't think because the world outside looks very different. And it may go back to being what it was before, it may not, but certain things remain true regardless right like income inequality is true this is what's happening and you can see it now you can see the difference between people who have covid and are living in shelters and trying to go uh, to school that way and you can see it with um j-lo's mansion and how you know isolation is not so bad when you have you know um 40 acres, 12 swimming pools, and 30 servants or something. I haven't been there. I, I'm just making those numbers up. But certain things are still true. Income equality is still true. Love and betrayal is still true. So all of these things that we can be thinking about, in some ways, what they are is actually we have a boiling point, right? We are all in an elevator right now. And the elevator either is you know, the United States of America as the container or the elevator is the home that you're in and this feeling of being boxed in. But it is still this sense of uh, there's something coming. Is the elevator going to move to the next floor? Is it going to drop? Are uh, the doors going to open? Who's going to walk in? Am I going to walk out? So the uncertainty levels are, uh, they're high. And at the same time, we're just moving along minute by minute and the hours are either slow um perhaps if you've got small children and you're trying to you know entertain them and have them not um pull your hair out uh, or they may be going fast if you find yourself feeling like um you're retired without um some sort of a you know nest egg and you're scrambling to figure that out so what i'm saying is if art doesn't sustain you, if the art you're practicing doesn't sustain you right now, try some other things to get in through any door. So uh, if that's music, if that's painting, uh, if that's the, the piece of art behind Michel, um, whatever it is, or in my case, uh, it's nature. That's what's here. I don't have a specifically great internet connection. Um, I'm excited that so far we're, we're still in business here. Um, but what I have is the vastness of nature and the sense of, you know, uh, there is a night sky and it is huge. And if I'm normally home in Brooklyn, that night sky is clouded over and is filled with, uh, you know, sirens, um, birds shouting, those sorts of things. It's very quiet out here, except for if someone mows a lawn or weed wax. So that's a very different environment in which to be at this time. And for me personally, I go back and forth between um, what is it like to be here and what is it like to be relatively safe here and know that everything that's going on in the greater world. Should I be at an artist's re residency right now or should I be 
back somewhere else. And that's, you know, that's sort of, that's a, a microcosm of the question of, should I be making art? Do I have something to say? Will anyone care if I say it? So that's a question that a lot of writers have is, what do I have to say that matters? Or what is the story that I have to tell and how, it can, how can it be any bigger than my own story? And so I think that there's a, uh, you know, two sides of this. And, and, and that really comes down to um, the political and the personal and the specific and the universal. And what we see time and again is if you're writing something that is universal, a, a generalized thing, some people somewhere doing something, uh, it's not, it's not as interesting. We don't know how to, we don't know where the empathy is. We don't know where to step in. But if we're looking at something that is, you know, uh, a kitchen in New Orleans and there's, uh, you know, beignets cooking and, uh, whatever. I'm not from New Orleans. I don't know why I picked that example. I can't so give go us a, very so far So give us an that. example, Winter. So give us an example of a work, either yours or other, where you think that, that, because it was so personal, because it was so specific, it, mm -hmm. it, it allowed a great universal truth to come out. I'm gonna say something that is not necessarily about a great universal truth, but is about how the specific lets us knock into something. And, that, and it's just this very simple example of, um, in my play in Darfur, which is about um, genocide in Sudan, in the early mid 2000s and there's a character whose name is Hawa and I have based her on a character who actually lived I don't know if she is still living but she was in a uh, newspaper that a newspaper article that my boss at the time uh, Nicholas Kristoff was writing as an op-ed there was this woman Hawa she was in a camp in Chad and she was uh, an English teacher and the reason that he was specific about that is that because as we are reading this, we know something about who that person is. That person speaks English. We speak English. That person is a teacher. We are teachers or we know teachers. There's a, that already is, uh, it brings us closer to empathy because there's something about that. Whereas if it's just someone who is in a camp and they are doing something we don't, we don't have any toeholds. So when I was working on my play and I named the character Hawa and had her be an English teacher and had some of the things that had happened to the actual Hawa be part of the foundation of my play, there's a scene in which uh, Hawa talks to the reporter and the aid worker about how she taught herself English. And she taught it by reading the play, uh, sorry, by reading the book by Edith Wharton, um, The House of Mirth. And so in it, she just says, you know, she has this monologue, how I loved Lily Bart. And so you've got this woman in this uh, environment where she can, she can empathize with Lily Bart. Lily Bart is nothing like her. Lily Bart is a, you know, turn of the century young woman who is, trying to marry up a station in order to survive because, you know, as a white woman, she's, she doesn't have many options. And it, it's, a, it's a wonderful book if you haven't read it. But it's important that Hawach is, is, is invested in the house of mirth and invested in this sort of universality of uh, womanhood and of being second-class citizens that you have to, uh, you have to fight for what it is that you want. You, you don't, you're not automatically entitled. And so there is, a, there is a similarity there in that Hawa is not automatically entitled. She is still of lower status in this camp than, um, well, there aren't a lot of men because in this camp, the men have already been killed. So it's not quite one-to-one. -one. But the point is, is that she has engaged in a life in which things are unequal. But it matters that she says these lines from Lily Bart because later in the play when she stopped by, they're at a checkpoint and they're trying to get across the border and the guard says, um, you know, how, do you speak English? And she has to pass herself off as being 
uh, an American and not a Sudanese. And so she begins to recite passages from the House of Mirth. And because it's the opening passage of the book, and because the guard doesn't speak English, he just, you know, or he does a little, he just hears her fluently speaking this thing, and he's like, oh, go, go ahead through. So this pivotal moment in the play in which they've been driving towards it this whole time turns on the fact that she's able to recite from House of Mirth. So if it's not House of Mirth, what is it, right? Is it Dickens, Great Expectations? Is it George Saunders, 10th of December? Is it Isabel Allende? Like it's, it matters what you choose because the listener is having some kind of experience with whatever that specific thing that you choose. It's different if I tell you for breakfast, I had some cereal. Or if I tell you I had steel cut oats that uh, it took me 20 minutes to make. And while I was making them, the pot kept boiling over. And when the pot boiled over, I burned the stove and the stove wasn't mine. And I was wondering, is the flame going to be put out? They just, just, there's a longer thing. And no, who cares about what I'm doing for breakfast? But if I needed you to know what my life was like at this particular moment, simply saying I'm eating cereal doesn't give you anything to chew on. It's boring, right? The general is boring and the specific is exciting. If I'm telling you a love story, we all know Romeo and Juliet and it's, or we know Adam and Eve, and these are these archetypal love stories or uh, things that go wrong. If I don't tell it with some specificity, then I might as well just be telling Romeo and Juliet and say, here's Romeo and Juliet again. Because the other piece of it is that the plots we're writing, they're generally not new. They're generally from something else. And so in order to make them feel new or make them feel our own, that's where the specific comes in. That's where we're telling about the lives that we have lived and we're imbuing our characters um, with those, uh, those, those characteristics, those yearnings, those needs. Um, a lot of times actors will you know, move from acting into playwriting and they tend to be very quick at picking it up and moving with it. And that's because it's the same muscle. So for those of you who are actors, that same thing that you're doing where you're trying to understand the character and the motivations and trying to think of a backstory and trying to think, why am I doing this? Why would I do this? You have to justify it. Those are the same things that you turn around and use when you're writing a play. You need all of those same faculties. It's just a different place. Instead of doing it in the theater, you're doing it in your home or in your writing place. But you have to go through all those permutations of what is this person specifically? And if you don't know what you're doing, you know that you're apt to wander around the stage and people can't connect with you. I mean, I think we've all heard Shakespeare where people are not connected with the words and then it does sound garbled. It's like, you know, but when they're clear, when they know what their intention is, then we sit up and we pay attention. So your job as a dramatist is to think about what is it that can make us pay attention? What is it that can draw us in? And how does empathy work, right? I think that theater is an opportunity to build empathy within a two hour period of time amongst a group of strangers. You're all going through this same experience. I think that um, op-eds and essays in, in, in newspapers are wonderful ways to build empathy. We're suddenly parachuted into someone's life. I hear a, a story of you know, a young boy who's a, a chess champion and he's an immigrant and his family doesn't have a home, but with his chess winnings, he starts to gain notoriety and the family, uh, the family is, their, their, their station is rising. They're becoming more secure. They get, uh, they get residency from the city, but at the same time, all these people read the article and they say, oh, this, this young boy who doesn't have a home, who's a chess championship, champion, how can I help? They send in all this money and the family, instead of saying, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to get a house or we're going to do this. The family stays where they are and they put the money in such a way that other people in their situation can share in that. They're looking out for each other. So the empathy that we have for that family grows. First, it's for the boy who's 
our protagonist and is succeeding at this thing, then it is for the family who loves this boy. And then it is for the family who looks out into their community and says, how can we take care of the community? And in turn, what is our participation in that? Did we send in money or are we simply moved when we hear about what this family did and is doing? And how does that matter in a time when we live in so much anti-immigration sentiment? So that story can open all of us up. That story can change the way that we think about something, which can shift the way that we write about something. So when I talk about political, it's political that we are living in a country that is anti-immigrant, right? That is a given and that is a danger. It's political that right now, uh, people who are Asian and are assumed to be carriers of COVID-19 are targeted. That is political. But in order to tell that story in a way that resonates, we have to choose one person or one family. You know, the, the, the good person of Sichuan is not about the entire village. It's about the good person. So it's the same political is to universal as personal is to specific. You want them to be uh, equally, they matter equally. You can't have one without the other. So what I thought we could do um, is just that we could do something participatory. And I came up with an exercise that I would love for you to do and I'll, I'll time it. Uh, I'm just gonna give you mm, five minutes. And uh, if you can go and get um, a paper and a pen, uh, if you don't already have one, um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to imagine the time it takes for you to get paper and a pen. Uh, and what I'm going to have you do is I just want you to write a 20 line scene and I'm going to give you two characters and two sentences. And your only job in this exercise is to say yes to whatever it is your characters A and B want to say. You don't have to tell a full story you don't have to tell a story at all. But can you take us into a moment in which whatever A and B are saying to each other feels authentic to the A and B in your mind? So none of us are gonna write the same A and B, but can we all bring whatever our personal experience is to what these people are saying? So the, what I want you to do is write 20 lines. So you can think of a line as each, each character, every time they speak, that's a line. So perhaps each of these people will speak 10 times. Um, the first line of character A. Character A is going to open the scene. I'm getting a thing to say it again. Don't worry, I will say it again. It's going to be a 20 line scene that you write on your own in your house, and I will time it. And it's going to begin with these two sentences. I'm giving you two characters, A and B. You know nothing about who A and B are. You get to decide who A and B are and don't even try to start thinking of it right now. Let A and B just emerge. We don't know. But the thing is, is that there's no, uh, you don't ever have to share this work aloud. Um, you, there's no obligation. You're not writing to please me. You're just, you're just trying something. And I'm just giving you something and we're seeing what happens. So I'm gonna tell you what character A says and then I'm gonna tell you what character B is saying and I will repeat that and then I will say again what the whole exercise is. So what you're going to write down is character A. Character A says, when the stock shifts, from abundance to scarcity, I will hoard my snacks. I'm gonna say that again. Character A says, when the stock shifts from abundance to scarcity, I will hoard my snacks. Character B then says, B says, I have been wanting to say I love you for weeks and now I am. So character B says, I have been wanting to say I love you 
for weeks, and now I am. So those are your two sentences. What you're going to do, I'm gonna give you five minutes. Uh, I'm gonna- We'll time it, we'll time those five minutes. We're gonna time the five minutes. Um, I'm gonna uh, give you a view of the mountains and uh, uh, you know, uh, so that I'm not making funny faces at you. Right. These are the lines that open the scene. This is a scene of two people whom you've never met. They are standing next to each other. They can be anywhere in the world. They can be on Mars, whatever. Um, it's just A and B. So you can name them if you choose, or you can stick with A and B. So what you're going to do, you're going to write a 20 line scene, which begins with these two sentences. A is going to say, a total of 10 lines and B is going to say a total of 10 lines. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, paragraphs don't each count as a line. Each time you speak counts as a line. So if you say, oh, that's a line. If you say, I'm going to the store and I have to get potato chips and I also want to tell you about what's in the dictionary, that's just one line. So we, uh, have, a, we have a question from Kathy saying, do these uh, lines occur at any point of the scenes or are they the first two gonna, lines of dialogue? They're the first two lines of dialogue. And right. this is the other thing that I'm gonna say. If at this moment you are thinking, I'm totally confused, I wanna do this right, I think I'm gonna get it wrong, uh, don't worry about it. You can't do this wrong. Even if you interpret the rules that I've given you wrong, there's no such thing as wrong. So go wherever your gut takes you. You're not writing to please me. You're just writing for the simple fact that I have given you a scenario and you're gonna go for it. What yes, I ask, yes, Michelle. No, no, that not everybody, if, if somebody doesn't wanna do it, they, they don't have to do it, of course. We're, we're, and we're not going to share unless he, people want to share, is that right? No, you guys actually have to do it because I'm going to come in <laughs> through the screen into your home and I, and I pull you up by your, your collared well, shirt. Listen, I'm trying to manage fear. I'm trying to manage fear. It's okay to be afraid. Uh, <laughs> nobody has to share anything and there's no way to do it wrong. So you don't have anything to fear, not even fear itself because there's, there's no fear on the table. Oh, FDR so, A says, when the stock shifts from abundance to scarcity, I will hoard my snacks. B responds, I have been wanting to say I love you for weeks and now I am. Go and write whatever comes next, 20, 20 lines, five minutes. Don't ask questions, just do it and see what happens. Okay. We'll be, we'll be back at 3.33, starting now. P.S. It doesn't matter if you are a playwright or a writer, just do it. Just give it a try. And now, here's the mountains.
All right. Welcome back, everyone. Don't uh, don't worry about uh, if you uh, did it right, um, because I have news for you. You did it right. All you needed to do was write it and see where it went. Um, what I would love to do is if there is anyone who wrote something that they would like to share, um, Michelle can uh, bring your face uh, up. Um, let's hope that just well, I was gonna say, let's hope that you're wearing clothes, but really, I don't, I don't want to put any chains on you. <laughs> uh, as, as you are, um, I would, is there anyone who would like to volunteer to read? You could just say A, B before each line. Okay, so Michelle Solomon said she would, and we also have Patricia Carlin, who already wrote it down for us. So if Patricia, oh, great, and, and Catalina, that's great. So we have three so far. Okay. So, um, uh, so Patricia, if you want, we can, oh, and, and, and Alina and Wendy, oh my God, this is so exciting. So Patricia, just because you start, I'm gonna start with you. I'm gonna allow you to come in. The first time I'm doing this, okay, so, uh, we're, okay, Patricia, give me a second. Um, okay, so give me a second and I'm going to allow you to can you hear me? video, yeah. I don't know why I can't. I think I have to put you as a panelist in order to see you. Just give me a second because the first time we're doing it. Okay, great. Patricia, you should be back shortly. Okay. Patricia, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, and we're starting video with you now. So Okay. Great. So so there you go. It's uh the screen is yours. All right, thank you. So uh, here's my story. When the stock shifts from the abundance to scarcity, I will hoard my snacks. I've been wanting to say I love you for weeks and now I am. What? We are in a crisis here, I'm starving, I'm worried. And after all this time you're saying you love me, you love me? Listen, Carol, we didn't have time to talk about this until now, I'm cooped up. I've been thinking about this for months since you're stuck in quarantine with me. I'm, I'm seeing you up close. I missed it all this time, but I can't stop myself from saying I love you, Carol. I do, I love you. Jean, I can't do this right now. I'm worried about my parents. I can't even go see them. My father has so many issues breathing. What if he catches this virus? I can't even go see him. And then you want me to tell them we're getting married? They're Catholic, we can't do this now. Okay, I didn't say married. So you love me, but you never want to get married? I didn't say never. I really <laughs> hate you right now. I really hate you right now. You're just hungry. You're like this when your blood sugar is low. You're right. Do you love me back? I do. I, I just can't talk about this now. When can we talk about it? We can talk about it after the quarantine. What if it never... Then we can't talk about it. <laughs> Here is a granola bar, your favorite, gluten-free. Please eat it. Okay, I love you too. All right. Patricia, Great, thank you, thank you so day. much. Thank you. Um, thanks for going first. What a brave move. Let's, uh, let's now move on to our next person and hear what you wrote. All right, let me, just give me a second. Uh, I'm. Uh... Uh, I'm trying to, okay, so the next person we said is Michelle Solomon. Uh, Let me just find Michelle here. Um, okay, here it is. And so we're moving to panelists. All right. Okay, give me a second, on mute, and then we can. Hey. Oh. All right, hi, Michelle, how are you doing? Okay, I, I, uh, I've been, uh, I haven't showered today, so. <laughs> go for I, it. I, I, didn't, I didn't type mine, so I hope I can read my own writing. Okay, here we go. And I didn't, my, my characters are like Beckett. They don't have any names. <clears throat> when the stock shifts from abundance to scarcity, I will hoard my snacks. I've been waiting to say I love you for weeks and now I am. 
is because great minds think alike. You know, that, that the snacks now, they don't have to be gluten-free after all because it's the end of the world. But I said, I love you. Yeah, and I love you. But I also love thinking about that I could have snacks that I could hoard. Like I have these little Debbie cakes and I never would eat them because they're so full of processed and they're so not gluten-free. And I'm always on Nutrisystem. So anyway, but wait a minute. I just said, I love you. It's a, it's a monumental moment for me. And, and all you care about is gluten-free and little Debbie's. No, 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 I care about the world ending. And I care about the, the fact that, that we're in a pandemic and that we're in a bunker because now, well, we found out that this really isn't what they're saying it is at all, that this is a, a biological warfare. So, so, uh, so no, I'm sorry, I can't read my own writing. <laughs> so, so, so I, I just want snacks. I just have, I, I have no <laughs> stocks. Oh, that's what I said. Okay. So no stocks, no abundance, just little Debbie's. Well, well, will you ever tell me you love me back? Silas eats the little Debbie. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. That was wonderful. All right. Let's, uh, that was fun. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. So next one. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Uh, we have Michelle. Uh, we have Catalina Otero. Let's get Catalina on board. Uh, give me a second. And where's okay? Okay, can you see and hear me? Yes, Catalina, yeah. welcome. Yeah. Um, the sc screen is yours. Thank you. So I, I don't really have experience with screenwriting, and it's definitely, I don't know if it's as creative, but I'll <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Cool. Okay, so uh, A, when the stock shifts, oh, yes, when the stock shifts from abundance to, to scarcity, I will hoard my snacks. B, I have been wanting to say I love you for weeks, and now I am. A, oh, wow, I love you too. B, I know it's a little unexpected. A, no, that's fine. I'm happy to hear how you feel. I love you very much, and I'm grateful to be here with you now. B, I know nothing is certain, especially right now, but for the brief time we are on this earth, I find it crucial to let you know. <laughs> you feel forced to say it back. A, I don't feel forced at all. I agree with you. This time is very uncertain, and I am so happy to be in this exact moment with this in this exact room with you. B, I feel good now that I told you. Do you need to get more snacks? <laughs> I actually do. I ate my box of Laura bars last night. B, you are a bad snack hoarder. A, I know. B, shall we go to the market? A, um, where's my mask? <laughs> All right. All right. Thank really you fun. so much. Thank, Thank you, you so Catalina. Much. Thank you. We really appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So we are moving now. Um, uh, uh, sorry, let me just, Catalina, to Alina. I think I'm saying that wrong, but uh, I'm gonna go with it. I'm gonna go with Alina. I think. But there's a there's an A. Well, we'll, we'll let her. She, oh, I can't. To, I can't see the name. The mystery. I was just guessing off your fantastic pronunciation. Right. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, no. From mess with the Venezuelan. That's absolutely acceptable <laughs> in, under these circumstances. All right. Mystery. Mystery. She, she should slowly appear. Let's see. Um, let me see. This is oh, like we're in, we're, in a, we're in a movie and you're supposed to be the code breaker. Yeah, I know, but, but I'm trying to... Oh, Okay, so great. So, uh, um, wait. Okay, you're, you're, you're there. We go. <laughs> I'm gonna go okay. with I'm gonna go with Elena as pronunciation. Yes. <sighs> Elena. <laughs> Elena. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um. Cool. I'm going to read. Um. A. Stock shifts from abundance to scarcity. I will hoard my snacks. B. I've been wanting to say I love you for weeks, and now I am. A. My snacks. B. I love you. A, we need to go to the store. B, I love you. A, we need to go to the store now. B, did you hear me? A, did you hear me? At the same time, A and B. 
I love you. We need to go to the store. B, can we talk for a minute? A, a minute. That's a long time. We don't have that kind of time. Time is money. Money, money, money. We are running out of money. Oh no, 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 no. What are we going to do? B, we can talk for a moment if you'd like. A, I would not like that. I would like to go to the store. B, the store is closed. A, but my snacks. B, we cannot, we cannot have snacks anymore. A, none? <laughs> B, no. A, okay. B, now. I have really been wanting to tell you this. I've been waiting to tell you this. I love you. A, okay. That's nice. All right, great, great. Right. Thank you, Elena. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Thank you. All right. So we are now moving. You let me know how many. A lot of people want to do it, Winter. So if, if you have the time, we'll hear them all. If you want to put a limit, it's up to you. So Wendy uh, is up. Great. Um, let, let's just uh, bring Wendy up. Um, are you sure she pronounces it Wendy? Maybe it's Winidi. Yes, yes. Okay, but yes. it's spelled Wendy. We don't. Sure, sure. Of course, winter, of course, you mess with the Venezuela. No, it's, it's completely, completely, I, I have no feelings whatsoever. I am, it's there like, she is. All right, Wendy, hold hi. on a second. Well, let me start. Okay, Wendy, there you are. And yes, it is Wendy. Uh, I don't <laughs> have a strange pronunciation. <laughs> cool, so um, I only made it to 14 lines, but we, cool. we got there. Um, a, when the stock shifts from abundance to scarcity, I will hoard my snacks. B, I've been wanting to say I love you for weeks and now I am. A, what, because of my affinity for snacks? B, you always know how to make me laugh. A, hearing you laugh is my favorite sound in the world. B, we haven't been doing that enough lately, huh? A, well, divorce doesn't usually bring out the best in people. B, maybe it's the lack of fresh air talking, but... I I don't even know why we're getting divorced anymore. I mean, I do, but you know, A, yeah, I know. B, do you think we could give things another shot? A, are Oreos my favorite dessert? B, really? A, you know the answer. B, I guess I do. Great, great. All right, thank, thank you, you Wendy. Thank you. All right, so we're going to move on to uh, so Patricia already did to, to Liz Cruz Peterson all right Liz let's bring you up here to the panel all right uh, pump. a second there she is there she is all right Liz can you hear us yes wait a minute I guess I have to start my video so there you go. Okay. There you are. Ah. Hi, everyone. I'm enjoying this immensely. Thank you very much. Um, A, when the stock shifts from abundance to scarcity, I will hoard my snacks. B, I have been wanting to say I love you for, long, for weeks now, and now I am. A, here. B, what is this? A, plantains. B, <laughs> thanks. Did you hear what I said? A, yes, and I answered you. B, when? A, just now. B, what, what did you say? A, are you losing your, your hearing? <laughs> B, tell me. A, they're plantain chips. B, no, not that. A, do you want something else to eat? B, no, thanks. Eats a chip. So, will you share your, um, will you share them with me? A, share what? B, your snacks. A, I am. B, when the stocks are scarce. A, of course I will. B, why? A, because I love you. That's thank you, thank you. Thank that you. was wonderful. That was wonderful. So now, um, uh, Liz, so Kami uh, said, happy to read mine, but I only have to line six. Okay, okay. Kami, that's all right as well. <laughs> yeah. Let's bring Kami in. And it'll take a second, as it always does. Uh, for Me Kami. saying hi to Liz, <laughs> who's still with us. 
I Corey, think, there you go. Oh. There's Cami. I don't have Cami. I just have us. Well, she's going to be here in a second. In the, in the downtime, I would like to teach you all how to pop and lock. That's just our meeting. Okay, Cami. You, can you hear you can us? Hear, yeah, I can hear you the whole time. Can you hear me? It, we, can can't, hear you. we can't see you yet, but that's okay. We'll try one more time to, for your video to start. Uh, but uh, so I think you have to accept the video. Accept. Oh. If not, it's okay. You can just start reading and we'll, we'll imagine you as, as well as we'll imagine the characters. Yeah. Okay. All right. A. When the stock shifts from abundance to scarcity, I'll hoard my snacks. B. I've been wanting to say I love you for weeks and now I am. A. But you're not listening to me. B. I just said I love you. A. I can't think about that now when I wor worry about having enough snacks. B. You really are something. A. What do you mean? I'm planning for disaster. <laughs> B. But you're not listening. Didn't you hear a word of what I said? I thought you'd be happy to hear me say I love you. Now I feel like I should take that back. A. We need food, dear, to live on. You can't live on love alone. <laughs> B. So what are you really telling me? A. That's so stupid. I'm not even going to answer that. Could you listen just once in your life? And then she repeats the first uh, sentence. Uh, when the stock shifts from abundance to scarcity, I'll hoard my snacks. B. Oh God, can't you hear yourself? When the stock shifts, it hasn't even happened yet. So why do you carry on? And then I ran out of time. <laughs> thank you so much. Tommy, thank you so much. We, we really appreciate it. No All problem. right. This is wonderful. Thank you. So I see here Sharon saying fabulous, but that doesn't necessarily imply that she wants to do it. And I don't want her uh, to feel like. So if you want to do it, just write one more time that you want to do it and you'll be next. Meanwhile, I'll ask my friend Gavin, uh, who's, who's after that, uh, to, to share his. Gavin Gregory um, uh, will bring uh, to, will bring to the panel. At any minute now. <laughs> uh -huh. Promote to finals. This is my imitation of what a snake would be doing if it was listening to these stories. And what's kind of embarrassing is that because I can't see any of you, I'm just acting like I'm in a room by myself, which. Okay, so Gavin is here. Gavin, let's, Did you see you? let's see you, Gavin. Are you there? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and I just want to say, Gavin, uh, are, you, are you still with us in Miami or are you? Uh, oh, no, no. I'm, I, I came back to Atlanta. You came back to Atlanta. So Yeah, so, yeah. And shaved my head. You did. And, and it nice. looks stunning. So hopefully, uh, for those of you who, after hearing Gavin, want to continue to hear more of Gavin, you have to wait until a wonderful world continues at Miami Drama and see him perform Stunningly, this is an outstanding actor. Somebody that once you work with him, you want to continue to work with him. He is he does the role of King Joe Oliver in the production of A Wonderful World at mm -hmm. Miami Drama. So uh, that, that that is my introduction. I'm sorry I couldn't do as enthusiastic introduction to everyone, uh, <laughs> but but I just I just you know this man I absolutely this is just. I love you, Michelle. Michelle. There is no way I'm going to be able to live up to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said you're a phenomenal actor. Your writing ability is something completely different. All right, my okay. friend. The screen is yours. Okay. Oh, my God. I'm so embarrassed. Okay. So, when the stock shifts from abundance to scarcity, I will hoard my snacks. B, I have been, wait I have been wanting to say I love you for weeks, 
and now I am. A, I don't know what you mean. B, <laughs> stop acting like you don't know. A, why are, you why are you turning this into a weird situation? B, my love for you isn't weird at all. You <laughs> are deflecting. A, I'm deflecting because I don't love you. B, <laughs> yes you do. A, I love you as my friend, nothing more. B, why are you giving me, sharing with me your thoughts? Uh, wait a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Uh, <laughs> why are you sharing my thoughts? A, because, because that's what friends do, share thoughts. B, actually, not like, the, not like the ones you just shared. A, what about the snacks? B, you know <laughs> about my dress. A, what? B, you said you loved me in my dress. A, so I can't give you a compliment? B, you know how I feel about you. A, you, you, you're scaring me. B, I'm scared about how I feel about you. A, I'm scared of you. B, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> All right. Gavin, yeah, I mean, that was wonderful, my friend. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you. This is fun. Yeah. Thank you so much for... Wonderful to see you. And hope to see you very soon. And hope to be back with you on stage. Whenever Definitely. the apocalypse is over, we'll return with a bang. Again, with a wonderful world. That's the first thing. You heard me say at every single uh, a webinar we've done. But we will, as soon as we're able to open the Colony Theater, it will return with a wonderful world. And I will return my hair. With your hair, that's right. <laughs> or we have to buy a wig. Thank you, my friend. All right. Bye. <laughs> okay, let me... Uh, I'm trying to put you back. Okay, let me... Give me a second. Give me a second. Um, all right. Well, I can't move him back to ATD for some reason. All right, we have... Uh, bye -bye. Sorry. Um, a, okay, Casey. Casey, our good friend Casey Sacco. Uh, the, um, if, if you look, let, let's take your word for it, Casey. Where where are you? Um, hold on a second. Let me find Casey here and um, promote to panelist. All right. Uh, so, and I, I just want to say that Casey, uh, for the last uh, three weeks, uh, she, or, or, or before we, are you there, Casey? Yes, there hi. Are. Oh, there you are. <laughs> so for, for the last, um, so before Miami Drama was forced to, sh to, 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 to go to sleep or go into hibernation, um, Casey helped us for three weeks or, or, or maybe a little bit more um, in the office at Miami New Drama, uh, supporting uh, the, the the office, and uh, we loved having you around. Uh, had a great time. Well, well, we all had, and hopefully you'll, you'll you'll be able to continue as soon as we're able to continue. But anyways, um, <laughs> screen is yours. Okay, cool. Um, I wrote a couple. And I just think you're also she's also a phenomenal uh, South Florida actress. So yeah, fine. I try. All right, here we go. I wrote a couple uh, stage directions because I couldn't help myself. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, a is at the pantry. B is sitting on the couch eating Oreos. A, when the stock shifts from abundance to scarcity, I will hoard my snacks. B, to the Oreos. I have been wanting to say I love you for weeks and now I can. <laughs> what, are you serious? B, hell yeah, I am. A, Mitch, I can't believe that you didn't say anything before. I've, I've loved you since we were 13. You have been the first thing that I think of when I wake up for 15 years, even living together and being so close every day. I never thought that you'd feel the same. I'm, I, I'm so sorry. I, I'm just in shock right now. I, I don't know what to do with myself. B, O, A, don't you have anything else to say? B, well, I don't really know what to say. A, just smiles. B, J, I think you're awesome. You're one of my closest friends. A, what's happening here? <laughs> B, I, A, Mitch, why do I feel so weird right now? Shouldn't, shouldn't this be like a great thing? I, I don't understand. B, 
J A. Am I crazy? Did you just say you loved me? B. Well, I mean, I do, man. I really do. But uh, A. Mitch B. I was sorry, and my dog is now. <laughs> um, B. I was talking to the Oreos. A. Uh, oh my God! Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Oh, this is, this is like, <laughs> this is double drama. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, B. Oh, sorry, Jessica, I have to step out for five minutes. Jessica, uh, would you mind just to continue my role as I return? I am sorry, I apologize. Okay, continue. No worries, we're at the end, we're at the end. B, listen, A, <laughs> I knew, I definitely knew that you were talking to your Oreos. I, I was just, I was just joking with you. B, Oh, okay, yeah. A goes back to the pantry, B goes back to Amy Oreos, and C. <laughs> uh, that was fun. <laughs> it was also fun to have your co-stars. All oh, yeah. right, uh, sorry, okay. Thank you so much, that was brilliant. Uh, I have to run for a second. Jessica, would you mind taking over for the next few minutes? Thank I think I'll go over for a minute. Um, if we just want to pause here, because I don't actually have the controls to bring people in to uh, speak. Uh, <laughs> is what I was trying to get Michelle to say. But if there's something from here, if we want to take an interim, a moment, a pause to just reflect on the, the pieces we've heard. and Well, why don't we, uh, why don't, why don't I just chat for a minute? I know we're going to have questions, but there were, um, there was something that I wanted to, uh, oh, someone is asking for feedback from me. Okay. <laughs> this is what I'm going to say, which is that when you make the stakes of what's happening to your people be grand, then we are locked in and paying attention, right? So uh, if this were a scene in which your people immediately uh, went back to playing Legos or something, then you would lose the fire of where you began. But what you all did is that people took it somewhere. Either there was a grave misunderstanding and someone did not mean it to them at all, which is sort of a, a you know, its own tragedy, or someone was completely excited and uh, then they wanted to, uh, you know, go, go further. What do we, what do we do now? I can't, you know, we're in love. Well, great. Um, so I love that, uh, I love that you all took the, uh, took the prompt and went somewhere completely different. Um, I probably won't forget, um, someone saying, I love you to Oreo cookies, just cause I feel like that probably would be the sort of thing I would be doing if I were, um, hoarding my snacks with someone else. And I, <laughs> and I want to say that just in terms of this, this writing prompt, uh, I was reading the newspaper last night looking for things, uh, and I'm going to give you these things later um, for you to take with you. Uh, but I was, I was looking for things that would, would catch my eye as, as things that were writing prompts. And I, be I believe that um, someone in the newspaper was saying the stock shifts from abundance to scarcity. And I immediately thought about I will hoard my snacks. That's something that, that I would do because I realized I'm in this group of people and there was some M&Ms that came in and I, I, was, I was hoarding them. And I was thinking, I'm really not a generous person when it comes to snacks. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I began there and I thought, well, how do we elevate where we're going from snacks so that this isn't simply something that stays in the realm of snacks where we have someone come in and immediately up the stakes. I've been wanting to say I love you for weeks and now I am. So we immediately know that these two people have a relationship together. And that's what you want with your characters is how quickly can you let your audience know what the relationship is without specifically saying, you know, B, we can't be together. You're my brother. And I'm so glad you're back from Cincinnati, but you have to hoard your own snacks, right? Like we want it to flow as uh, this thing that these two people in this situation with these particular elements, snacks, uh, a pandemic, let's say, um, 
what they would do. And I, and I love that you all followed in that and that there wasn't sort of this thing where someone, someone, you know, started quoting the Smurfs or something like you all took an approach where you committed to what you were writing and went with it. And I just want to say, I think it's super bold um, because here, all of you, we can't all see each other. And I think that's a tremendously bold thing to, uh, to, to volunteer to do it and to uh, have your face seen and your words heard by people who you can't see. Um, I, just, I agree. I think that's really, I really I agree. That cool. was awesome. I did a little side writing thing and I'm not a writer, but I just did it just in case to keep things moving forward for you, Winter. And I was just like, okay, I can put this aside because everyone was so excited to participate. So that was amazing. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited when I see uh, all of your names pop up with a, with a Me Too and a and, and all of that. Um, what I could do, um, let's see. I have, so I have these, uh, have these, um, the, these, these things that I pulled from the newspaper that I wanted to give you as, as a, a take home thing. Uh, I was gonna give them to you at the end, but I could give them to you now because I mean, who knows when the end is coming? It's a time of uncertainty. So uh, eat your dessert first, okay? Um, I would love to just give you these things. I'll, I'll speak them and you can write them down. And I know that that is not always the easiest way for people to take them in. So uh, I will also figure out a way to um, get them uh, either posted in the chat thing or somewhat to you. But let me just give you these things. Um, the first one is very short. And uh, I would like to see you begin uh, a very short play um, that is on the theme of what this quote is. I always write with a sense of shame. So I always write with a sense of shame. And I would love for you to write a very short play. This is not, not something that you're gonna read with us, but something on your own after We've all faded into our own isolation tanks. Um, but I always write with a sense of shame. What is something that you could write that you're not going to show anyone and that you won't show anyone, but that is something that is shameful for you or for one of your characters? Because I think um, I've been noticing how much shame is a motivator in terms of the actions we take and the things that we do, but it's not usually it's not usually at the forefront in plays, but I'll give you an example. In Death of a Salesman, there's the scene where uh, Biff, his son, wants to be, you know, he wants to be a man. He wants to be a provider. His, his time is over. He was, you know, he was good in high school and played football, and now things haven't worked out the way he wanted them to. And he's he's asked his dad to help him get an interview. He gets the interview. He's super nervous. He's been, you know, trying to impress uh, his girlfriend. He goes to this interview and it doesn't go well. And he thinks that this guy is going to give him a job and be his key out. He has focused himself on all he has to do is show up and be the, the charismatic Biff that he was. And he tries that and it fails. And as soon as the guy leaves the room, Biff steals one of his pens. And it's this tiny, tiny act, but it resonates in his life continuing onwards because he's so ashamed that he took the pen. And so it's not something where, you know, in that moment he's saying, oh my God, I'm so, I'm so ashamed. I'm, I'm taking this pen. No, he just, he wants to get back at this guy. This guy has not come through for him. He's so disappointed. And so he does this very juvenile acting out thing of taking the pen. And once he's done that, he can't show his face back in that office again. Like it's the guy is going to know, Biff took my pen. Like I didn't have a job for him and then he took my pen. So it's just this, this level uh, on, a, on a sort of common way in which humiliation is experienced. And that is a play very much about humiliation. You know, how does it feel to, um, to be an adulterer 
and to have to face that humiliation in front of your family? Um, how does it feel to, you know, uh, she says of her husband, attention must be paid. And that's because this is a man who has lost his footing. He, people are not paying attention to him. So while I do urge you to read many other things besides um, Arthur Miller and the white male canon, what I will say is as you go along, just in your own life, pay attention to what are the things that bring you shame and why? And then what do you do in response to them, right? Do you do something that is even more shameful to sort of like continue the trend? Or do you try to uh, ameliorate it by going in another direction and doing something that is somehow uh, selfless or what you think is good? Um, but just to keep an eye on it and see if it's something that you can bring into uh, the writing that you do or the acting that you do, or even just how you are in relationship to other people. If you think about what are the actions that we take that are motiva motivated by our own shame, what do we do? Um, I, so I have these three other things, but now that Michelle is back, we can go back right. to hearing. And I apologize. I, I thought uh, we could let other people in without me, but so where, can you just tell me where, where was the last person we? Casey. Oh, sorry? It was the last person you did because Jessica doesn't have the magic power. I know. It's a, Casey I mean, she has magic, he has magic power. We had Casey, who was brilliant. And then uh, who's next? Uh, do we have, give me just give me a second, try to find the list. Casey. Well, is Jessica, it, you, I mean, I, I think you also wrote something, Jessica. Why don't you? I did it just in case. It's okay. Susan Dean was the next one. <laughs> okay. Susan <laughs> Dean. Let's, let's look at our, our friend Susan Dean and ask her, promote the panelist. All right. And, and here she is. Susan. We can hear you. Oh, good. Hi. <laughs> uh, we can see you as well. Okay. I wasn't sure um, it was better with the computer below or at this level. I want to block. You, can you hear me all right? Because I didn't put my headphones in. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Let's try this. I'm trying to figure out how to read this. Okay. <clears throat> so it takes place in a kitchen and pantry. Um, okay. Character A. Open scene. When the stock shifts from abundance to scarcity, I will hoard my snacks. B. I have been wanting to say I love you for weeks, and now I am. A. Oh, really? So now you tell me? B. Yes, I'm telling you now. A. You just want to make sure you get snacks. B. I'm so hurt you would say that. A. Well, it's true, isn't it? B. Mm -hmm. That I love you, yes. A, no. I mean about the snacks. You choose now to tell me? B, I chose to tell you now because it's a global pandemic. <laughs> A, I told you to stock up weeks ago before the shelter in place. B, oh my God, are you serious right now? A, about what? The snacks? Very serious. They're mine. B, I finally tell you I love you. A, that's so interesting. You decide to tell me now, timing. B, but now, you know, I'm not sure I do love you. A, you're just fucking with me. B, no, just surprised by your reaction. So selfish. A, why is that? B, because you wrote in your journal that you were hoping I'd tell you that I love you for weeks. B, I got mixed up, sorry. You read my journal? <laughs> well, I had to know what you were thinking. A, you could ask me what I'm thinking. B, you never tell me. A, yes, I would have. B, no, you wouldn't. A, get out. I knew we shouldn't have become roommates. B, mm. it's a shelter in place. I can't leave. Do you have any nuts? <laughs> That's it. I, <laughs> I got lost on the lines trying to read from far away. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. So thank you so much. That was great. Um, uh, wow, look at that. <laughs> I love it. Well, what did you say? Sorry, you're, you're muted. So 
Oh, no, it was, it was hard to read. Okay, no worries. Thank you so much. You're great. Thank you. All right, so we, we are, okay, Jessica, you can help me out here. Jessica, who do we have next? Uh, Susan, Amanda? Is no. that a get? Uh, oh, Katie no. Million. Oh, sorry? Katie Million? Million? Okay. Million. Okay, let's uh, find uh, the pronunciation. <laughs> uh -huh. Katie Million. Let's uh, promote the panelist. All right, Katie, we'll see you in a second. Maybe she pronounces it Katai. You don't know. Yes, all right, all right, Winter. All right. <laughs> Katie. Hi, how are you? Very good. How are you, Katie? Great. Nice to meet you guys. Hi. Um, okay. So my little thing. All right. So it takes place on Hinge. So I'm going to be doing this when it's like the message they're sending each other. And what is Hinge for us uh, above 25? <laughs> for the over 25 year old. Over 25 uses Hinge. Um, it's, and it's a dating app. Like it's a dating app. Okay, like, good. A lot Thank of you. Typing. Okay. Um, and in it, I had, I used like a structure where I would put like dot, 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 you know, like little text bubbles when people are like typing. So I'll just okay. say dot, dot, dot when that happens. Okay. Okay. When the stock shifts from abundance to scarcity, I will hoard my snacks. I've been wanting to say for some time, I've been wanting to say I love you for weeks and now I am. Brandon, we talked about this. No, we haven't. Not really. Yes, we... No, you change the conversation each time I try. Every time I begin to open up and tell you how I feel, you sign off, or your phone battery dies, or you fall asleep. Why are you so afraid of being loved? I am not afraid. Then what is it? You tell me since you have all the answers. Psychoanalyze me already, right? Got me all figured out. You can't shrink me like you do with your patients. That's not it. That's not what I meant. I would never, look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Reese. I didn't mean for it to come out that way, I promise. Dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. You still there? No? Yes? I love you. Dot, dot, dot. Why don't you believe me when I tell you that? Dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. It's not that. What is it then? I do believe you. That's the problem. Why? Because I don't understand how you can love someone without ever meeting them. I mean, we've been talking on here for two months now, babe. Ooh, he called me babe. Okay, um, but you said you were crushing on me the day we matched. Well, I don't think I used the word crushing. Send screenshots. Shit, never thought dating face-to-face -face would be easier. That's that. All right, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was outstanding. <laughs> Let, all right, well, uh, Madame Miller, continue. Yeah, yeah. So this is a, you want to open so we can open uh, the floor to questions and you let me know if you want to do that right now or if you want to share some more winter. Oh wait, again. there's a few more people chiming oh, in right. a different way. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. You want Cecile Strand? All right, let's get Cecile. She goes by Cecile Stranded. Cecile. Okay, Cecile. Let's. Uh, uh, there she is. All right. Next panelist. Okay. Let's just start video. All right, Cecile. Hello. Hello. Is is that all I do? And now I talk. Yes. Yeah, you're perfect. Yes. Welcome. Okay. Welcome. All right. I have a bit of a mess to read in my first time of anything like this. Great. When the stock shifts from abundance to scarcity, I will hoard my snacks. I've been wanting to say I love you for weeks, and now I am. You are so generous to love me with all my foibles. We complete each other. I know we wouldn't be standing inside this grocery store if I hadn't suggested we come. Of course, I would gladly be hiding in our apartment dreaming of the snacks we both love while looking lovingly at my stack of toilet paper. Thanks to you, I have learned to really enjoy eating healthy snacks. Not much on the shelf today. 
we must be part of a big movement of healthy eaters because some of them must have been here before us. <laughs> you know, when I get you on board with this diet, the good food begins to disappear. I have developed the right habit just in time to be confronted by choices that make that habit seem less important. <laughs> there isn't much here. Should we take the last package of trail mix? What do you think? We are lucky that we have money to buy food, so of course we can, but should we? No, you're right, and that's why I love you. We need to think of everyone. What are you doing? Taking a picture. We'll never forget this. An American grocery store with so many empty shelves. Can you imagine what your mother would say if she were alive today? She would say, we brought this on ourselves. Too much greed, not enough love. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for so the much. opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and so we have, I think, finally, so we have uh, uh, Charlotte, uh, dear friend also of the company, Charlotte, who's also a journalist, um, uh, is, if I can find her, there she is. All right. We have Jacqueline Shapiro as well. So maybe those were the, the final two. Um, uh, uh, let me just, Charlotte, just give me a second. Let me. Um, all right. Oh. Okay, Charlotte, we, Charlotte, we can hear you. There you are. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for doing this, by the way. Thanks for being here. Okay, this is also my first stab at writing a scene, even though I've been a journalist all my life. So. Awesome. Character A, when the stock shifts from abundance to security, I will hoard my snacks. Character B, I have been wanting to say I love you for weeks, and now I am. Character, I'll just read. How can you just throw that out at me at a time like this? Well, we are in a global pandemic. What do you think would be a better time? <laughs> this is a time where you must focus on specifics. This is not a time for muddled romanticism. Why? What does that matter? This could be the last time we ever get to say these things to each other. We don't know what's going to happen. I have to stick to specifics. It is only a specific plan that will get us through this. What do you mean? If you muddle my mind with romantic gestures, you break my concentration. What do you mean? What do you have to concentrate on? We are in a crisis. What are you talking about? Well, for instance, you went out today to, uh, to walk the dog, didn't you? Yeah, of course, you saw me do that. And you wore a mask, of course. And you took it off when you came in? Obviously. Well. Did you wash your hands once or twice? Once, when I came back. Now you see, that'll get you COVID-D. You have to do it twice. Don't you read the CDC reports? Ugh, they're impossible. I give up. That was great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Played out all the time. That was wonderful. <laughs> um, and then, so we have Jacqueline uh, Shapiro, who raised uh, her hand. Let's uh, bring her in. All right, Jacqueline, are you there? Jacqueline? Okay, so she might not be here. Maybe, Jacqueline? Okay. So, so what, I want, what I want you to continue. do, Michelle, Michelle, is I want you to imagine what Jacqueline would have written if she were here. And if you could do that scene for all of us, I think, I think we would very much like that. I think there's some things are better left to the imagination, don't you all think? Right. All right. Uh, oh. Yeah, see, the, your fans, your fans, <laughs> your fans want to see you have to improvise. Uh, so, yeah. Um, 
since Michelle is back and and can uh, facilitate questions, let's do yeah. that. And um, I can always give you these uh, lines that I have for you uh, later on in our session, or if we don't have time, uh, we can send them to you or post them or something. Brilliant. All right, so, so let's open up for, for questions. Let, let, let's open the floor for questions. We actually have a Q&A section. You, you, you can either do it through the chat or through the Q&A. Both of them are located uh, on, the, uh, on the lower section of your screen. Um, Q&A is towards the left and the chat is towards your right. That's a very so-so way of describing it, but uh, that's that. And so until questions come in, Winter, do you have any other any other thought? Okay, please. Uh, <laughs> oh, someone just wrote, Patricia, please mail us winter shame nuggets. Uh, are those me meaning the the uh, my personal shame nuggets? Because um you know i have too many to list uh but i will i will share um uh the question of can we hear the four things so you don't lose them if time runs out uh i think that we can i think that we can find a way to get them to you because you signed up by email so we can either email them to you that way uh or i don't know what do you what do you think michelle Yes, I feel that. I mean, we have everyone's email, uh, and so we can share. It so we have four questions. Before so I was totally not paying attention to what you were saying, I was looking at the questions. Um, so I'd like to hear Winter's list. I think again, I'm, I, you know, people want to hear that about your. I guess your my hey, list of shame. Can we hear those the four things, so we don't lose them if time runs out. You know what, what Marge is talking about, the four things? I do, and I'm saying that's what we could, uh, we could email to folks. Oh, that, that's what we'll email to folks we don't have. Good. Uh, so these short forms are simple. How about a longer play, which I find difficult? Well, let's not put the horse before the carriage. Uh, uh, we'll, <laughs> we, we can't expect somebody to write a play in, uh, during a webinar. Is that... Uh, Sure we can. I mean, you, you, you did, you guys did write plays. There's no, you know, there's no decision on how, how long a play has to be uh, to exist. There are obviously plays of any length. Uh, but Michelle's question is, uh, the short forms are simple. How about a longer play, which I find difficult? Uh, well, that's great that you find the short form simple. That's, that's wonderful. Um, I think short forms can be hard because you have a lot to say in a much more truncated period of time um, without being able to sort of rat a tat back and forth about, you know, a longer play, which I find difficult, uh, which is your question. Um, it depends on how you're going about writing that play. I think the first thing to ask yourself is um, why am I writing the play? What do I want to say in this play? And why am I the person to write it? Right, because plays take a long time. You could write a poem uh, in probably uh, less time. Uh, I'm not saying that poems are easy. They're very difficult. But if you're choosing to invest in the time that it takes to write a play, choose something that excites you. Choose something that you don't know the answer to. I think that all, all plays should be a question. What is something that you want to know about? Uh, I will give you an example. I read a newspaper article that said the National Association of Black Social Workers says that adopting a child transracially, meaning uh, the race of the child is different from the race of the parents, that that is akin to genocide. And I thought, wow, that's a really strong statement from you know, a, a group of social workers. What they're saying is, uh, you know, in this article is that they don't think that uh, black children should be adopted by people who aren't black. And I got really curious about that because I started to think about what, how are they measuring 
um, their definition of blackness. And how far do you go with that? Do you, it, it, is the idea, well, okay, if somebody is really dark skinned, they should be, a, they should be adopting someone who is very dark skinned. Uh, what, what exactly is it about race? that they are objecting to and where does it begin and where does it end? And so what I wondered about was, is there a best possible environment in which to adopt a child? What is the best thing for the parent? And because I didn't have the answer, this interested me as uh, what we've been told is, you know, that uh, the sort of, there should be a racial match and that it's a, a two parent household is better than a one, but is a three parent better than a two? Is a four parent, et cetera? So I had all of these questions, which I didn't know the answer to. And what I did in order to write the play was I went around and I interviewed people. And I got these fascinating stories of um, what, what people decided in terms of if they were adopting. And I did it from three angles. I looked at people who had been adopted themselves. I looked at people who were adopters who adopted children. And I looked at people who, um, when their child was born, put their child up for adoption. So it was the three angles of that because I wanted to explore, is there such thing as uh, a best case scenario? And the thing is, I, I can't answer that. Uh, I can't answer that for anyone. I can't answer that for the play. And that's what I find interesting is that I don't come out of the play being able to say, you shouldn't do this, or you should do that. But I come out saying, this is a question we should be asking. What does it mean? And how are we defining parenthood? Um, so in terms of, you know, a longer play, which you find difficult, make sure that you're curious about it and that you want to follow it through, that it, that it excites you and that you, uh, in the lasting of it, as you gather information and become more knowledgeable about it, that you aren't bored by it. So well, it's I interesting, I mean, it's just a winter story for, so, you know, because this is an important point. A more interesting play is a play that leaves you with more questions than with answers, right? You, you as a playwright, you, you do a disfavor if you want to try to just come up with one answer. And it's really interesting uh, because you want to write, and, and, and in a way, the, the theme of this webinar was making the political personal. And you know, even though you have strong political opinions, it, the, the work of art lessons, if you want to try to, in a way, teach, teach people a moral lesson or, teach, you know, or like answer and saying, but, but rather if, if, if the person leaves uh, the experience of the play with more questions than they hadn't even think of asking themselves. Right. That is that is definitely what I'm interested in because I I think that what plays are uh, a possibility to do is to examine the human condition and that by watching plays we put ourselves into the characters within it and we say what would I do if I were in this situation so right. for example if we're looking at Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun if I'm Walter Lee and I feel like I cannot contribute to this family and I have a dream. I have something that I want to do. There's something similar to that of being shut in by COVID, right? You are, you are prevented from being the self that you want to be in the world in which you want to be. And he sees this $10,000, this insurance policy as his chance to make good. He believes in himself and he believes that he's going to create something that will in fact protect his family. And of course the opposite happens and it's, it's a destruction <laughs> and, and that's a tragedy. Um, but it's, but you, as you're watching it, you can ask yourself, if I had been in his position, would I have made a different choice? If I had been in the mother's position and I was deciding, well, we should integrate a neighborhood or no, that's going to be too much. We should stay put. What would I do? There are people who think that a play should answer all questions. Um, a, a bunch of years back, I was uh, a script intern at this summer program, uh, the O'Neill Playwrights Conference, and there were all these wonderful writers there. And one of them 
uh, was August Wilson, and he was super chatty, and uh, we got into a, a debate, um, you know, which is maybe dumb. Twenty eight year old Winter and very accomplished August Wilson, but we disagreed, and he felt that a play should lay out the question and then answer the question. And I felt like the play should lay out the question and you journey through the play and you walk out trying to figure out what is the answer to that question. The thing that it has in common is that you go in with a question. You go in with something that you don't know about and you really wanna know about it. And it's that passion that can drive you. Uh, you, you could also, I think, write a play about something that you see that you think is really unjust um, and you want to call attention to that. And the way, uh, the way in of that, so that it is not so didactic, is to figure out what makes you the right person to write that story. For example, are you someone who is great with farce and you want to write a story about how, um, you know, the rich are uh, completely vapid? And, you know, that's how we end up with something like Moliere's Tartuffe. Um, or, do you want to write something that is, you know, a hard hitting drama um, in which some, you know, some, some lesson is learned by something? Uh, to go back to Arthur Miller in They Were All My Sons, sorry, just All My Sons. I always get it confused. There was, there was a TV <laughs> show called My Three Sons. Yeah. Uh, All My Sons. But, you know, he has put himself into a predicament where he's raising his boys and he has done something illegal and he has profited off of it. And he denies the, the complications of that and the, the results of that, that because he made these shoddy parts in order to keep his job and make money, there are men who are dying and that some of those men may be his son, right? So we get to this sort of last moment where he is, uh, repentant and wishing he could atone. And he's saying, you know, they were all my sons. He was responsible for what he did to them. So that is, that's something that we can talk about right now, right? Like that's, that's happening. You've got these senators who are saying, who are profiting off of a pandemic. And that's, you know, it's hideous and disgusting. There's a play right there. There's a play about what kind of senator profits and then does something uh, does he encounter something in which he is put up against his own need and he can't meet it, right? Does the antagonist become bigger than who he is at the beginning? I'm seeing a question. Okay, great. There, are, there are a couple of questions. First of all, uh, sorry for Michelle to completely misread her question and looking like an ass while doing it. Uh, so Marge has can we hear those four things? Oh, no. We, we, you, uh, that's, so for some reason, all the questions disappeared, and I'm not sure why. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, it's a mystery of technology. Um, meanwhile, uh, there is a question that is, I often find myself writing the same scene over and over, uh, similar dialogue and pace. Do you ever find yourself doing this? How can I break out of this? This happens for some reason every time I start a new play. This one, I will call it maybe blueprint scene for some reason, is always in my head. Yeah, this is something that um, I encounter with the students that I teach, and I also encountered it in, in my own writing. And there are ways to not do that. The first is, when you write the scene, move on. Write the next scene. Don't go back and try to fix that scene and rewrite it until you're satisfied with it. What you want to do with a new play is it's sort of like it's a train that leaves the station and you want to leave with it. And you don't want your train to stop at every station and say, is anyone getting on? Is anyone getting off? No, it's more exciting if the train whizzes by the station and someone has to jump on and hang on in order to get on that train. So in order for you to be in flow, one thing is you just keep going. You have the desire to make that scene better, but you don't. You set it aside and you know that you will come back to it and you will come back to it in the second draft when you know so much more about your characters because you will repeat. If you are writing A to B to A to B to A to B, you can't possibly learn what is going on until you get 
B to C and so on. So one of the things is to begin the play, write it. And, and truly, in, in, in the words of the great John Cage, begin anywhere, right? Your play can begin at the end. It can begin, it can begin with those, those prompts that I gave you. If that's the beginning of your play, that's totally, that's totally fine. What matters is, is where you go with it. So don't give in to the desire to make your scene perfect. If you find yourself mm -hmm. stuck and you're writing the same scene again, another thing that you can do is bring in something that is external so that it shifts the balance of the play. So for instance, if you've got uh, a couple and they're in the house and they're fighting, if there is suddenly a major storm that has been brewing and comes in, their fighting has to change because they're now in survival mode. So there's something exterior that's coming in that's, that's a weather thing that maybe you weren't thinking about. But the other thing that you can do is honestly to pick a newspaper headline and begin a scene with that headline that someone is saying that and see what happens. But you have to be willing to, uh, to not know where you're going and surrender to that. Because if you're trying to know every step of the way, if you, if you want uh, you know, to have it all mapped out, some people work great with an outline. But even so, you're going to repeat yourself. And that's just what happens. I just yesterday got caught um, repeating myself. Uh, I had this wonderful actor reading my words to me. And she read scene one and scene two of this particular pairing. And, and she said about scene two, you know, the stakes haven't changed. It's still, they're, having, they're doing the same beat over. But, the, but in fact, everything around them has changed. So they have to reflect that. And I couldn't see it myself. I thought, well, let's, you know, let's see what's going on. And as soon as she said it, I was like, you're absolutely right. Of course. We, you know, not only do we as an audience not want to see that same beat replayed, but if I'm being true to the momentum of the play and the momentum of these characters, the stakes have to rise because they have risen. So right. honesty. Right. But so, but it, so wouldn't you think that having sort of like an outline, I mean, there's different ways to getting into writing a story, whether it is, as you said, a, a headline that, or that you think of a character and, that, and sort of character is the reason you write or plot. I mean, there's different ways you can, you can but if somebody is sort of like caught in, 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 the, in the loop of writing the same scene, what do you think that- If you're thinking, caught in the loop, you have to change it up and you can do that by have a new character come in and change the, the, uh, the composition, the atmosphere of the scene. You know, you can do it, you can do it with weather. You can do it with a traumatic event, right? Like we were all living very different lives before COVID-19 and now it's very different. That can, that same kind of thing can be a part of your play. Um, and the other thing to do is, give your character a secret. Give one character a secret and give the other character the drive to find out what that secret is and see what happens. Or some, something I love to do or to assign is to have two characters, A and B, and A and B are talking about character C. And they're saying, like they might be saying how much they love character C or they might be saying all of the bad terrible things about character C. And character C, meanwhile, is eavesdropping. Mm. At a certain point in the scene, character C is going to enter and character C is either going to confront them about what they've been saying or ignore it, what happens. So you set up things to allow you, you set up a structure or a form to allow you to then move within the form and then you, you let yourself go. You don't say, okay, I have to, I have to get to this point in the scene. You just, you just check it out. You're just, you're getting information so in later often, drafts. How often later you, drafts? Winter, you personally start, like, do you, what is your in point? Is it an out, is it a, a you start with an outline of the story you want to tell? Do you start with a scene that you know that it's somewhere in the critical moment of the play? What is your in? Uh, it depends on if what I'm writing is uh, a commission or is stemming from something else. For example, 
there have been plenty of times in my life when I've been given a writing prompt, you know, whether it was Paula Vogel doing one of her bake-offs where she gives a series of prompts that are words and you are to incorporate those and write a short play out of it within, uh, I forget whether it's, I think it's 48 hours, right? So that's mm -hmm. one way into a play is that you've got a time limit and you have to just get through it and whatever you come out with at the end, that's what you come out. Uh, I've also, you know, been told this is, you know, this is a subject that I want you to write about. Uh, so then I try to learn about the subject. Or if I'm commissioned to write for certain actors, then I will interview the actors and find out what are they interested in? What do they care about? What are they good at? Right? It might even be something as simple as somebody is, uh, has a great, you know, Portuguese accent. So then I might say, okay, I want to try to work that in. What does that mean? But most of the time, I have started the actual writing of my plays where I just start and someone starts talking and someone else starts talking and, uh, and I see where they go. And in my best moments, I am simply saying yes to whatever comes through, no matter what that is, even if it is completely unreasonable and suddenly there's a talking horse and I was sure I was gonna not write a play with a talking horse, I let it happen. And I let it get on to the next thing because the talking horse may never be in the play, but whatever it leads me to next after that, that is the thing that I want. So I allow for unknowing and unknown without saying, oh my God, why haven't I gotten anywhere or what is this? Because the, the, the idea that you just sort of sit down and write a play from start to finish, sometimes that happens. I have had that happen. I definitely have. I have had situations where I wake up and I have the plot of a play and I just need to sit down and write and it comes pouring out. And, and those are, you know, um, wonderful moments in which I'm channeling something that is certainly bigger than myself. And my job is to just get out of the way. But there are other times when I know that I have to have certain things happen and then I do have to plot it out. Then I do have to make an outline and say, okay, if this happens, then this happens. But it, for me, it really depends on what is the play. But I usually am invested in the play because I'm interested in the character, something about them. And, and I'll say a few things for those of us who have been uh, attending from the, from the first uh, workshop we did with Oren Squire. There is, you know, something, and having worked with Winter, I think both of those, writers overwrite. They write, you know, yeah. and, and write a bunch of scenes that you know that it's probably not going to make it into the play, but it's probably going to uncover something important uh, that, that, that you as a, a playwright needed to know, uh, and you, you could only find out by writing that scene. So, uh, you, you know, and we did something similar, uh, you know, with Oren. Oren wrote a ton of scenes and then we sort of decide, you know, he sort of figured out what's the beginning, what's the middle and what's the end. And then sort of like force it into making more sense and working with Winter, we, you know, we, she brought in a ton of materials and we're like, well, sure, this seems like a beginning material. This seems like middle material. And, the, and, and we know that a lot of what she wrote is just probably not going to make her final, her final, um, draft but uh, don't be you know uh, don't be afraid of overriding right i mean don't be afraid of just just writing things that, that you also have the freedom of saying let me just write this and this might just not end up being in the play and that's fine yeah you have to overwrite you have to overwrite in order to be able to have something that you lean out later that you get in there and either with a hacksaw or a chisel you take out uh, a very quick story. I've been working on this play about abortion since maybe 2013. Tons of research and it was a massive play. The first time I ever heard it, it was like three and a half hours long. I have spent the last five years trying to make it smaller and smaller and smaller without diminishing what I love about it and what I want in it. And just in January, I had a public reading of the play. Not the first time, there've been many along the way. Uh, it was a fundraiser, you know, and what I did, we had a rehearsal. The actors came in. It was a cold read. They'd never seen the script before, except for this one actor who I'm very close to and who knows the script a lot. But we 
did the rehearsal and I was directing it and I heard it and I went up to her and I said, oh no, this is much too long. What am I gonna do? And she goes, I know, honey. We'll look at it tomorrow because there was gonna be another reading of it. And I said, but what are we gonna do about tonight? And she said, well, do you wanna make some cuts? And I said, yeah, let's. And we stood at music stands and in the span of 45 minutes, we cut out 24 pages of my 86 page play. And then in front of an audience, these actors went on, read a play that was different from what they had. And I'm not talking about just, you know, cutting off full scenes. It was inner cuts, it was surgery, and then major cuts. And these were scenes that I loved. These were scenes that I was sure belonged in this play and had to be there. And when I heard it that night, I thought, oh, this is what the play is supposed to be. It is supposed to be without those 24 pages. And the only thing I missed was one line. And I haven't put it back in. I could, maybe. But, but I, in being able to hear the play in this sort of very uh, to the bone sense, I understood now what the play was. And it would have taken me months to get to that point. And part of it is because I would have said, oh, but I think we need this. This really matters. And in having this person that I trust and in going through it and just going all out and, and saying, none of this is precious, let's see what happens, the play emerged. So there have been, I don't even know how many scenes jettisoned, uh, how many rewrites, just tons and tons and tons. And that's just the way it is. Like that's how some plays are. Whereas the play that I directed last summer, I just wrote in a writing workshop that was a week long, we had to bring in 10 pages every day. And I didn't spend long writing it. You know, I just typed it in, which I never do. I write longhand and then I revise it. I typed it in and the play at the end of that, it felt like a play and it felt like it was what it was. And that felt like, I, I didn't even know what I was writing. I just had someone start playing hangman and that began the play and that continued. That's how that play begins. So some of it is, uh, some of it is luck, but, but most of it is the discipline to say, I will cut this out because I can put it in another play or it is not serving the story. And the even bigger thing is to simply say, yes, the thing comes in and you just say, I don't know where it's going, but I will follow it because you can always go back and say, this is the point where I derailed. I'm going to cut that out. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to move from there. Um, I see that there are some other questions, so I'm just going to so do the tackle uh, them. Your background in theater inform your journalism, or actually, yes. it's the other way around. It's not. It's not actually. Uh, from the time I was seven, I wanted to do theater. I, I wanted to be an actor, and uh, from some time around there, my father wanted me to be a journalist, and. Uh, he was really pushing for that and I was really pushing against that. And what happened is um, when I was in college, I was writing uh, the opinions uh, in the newspaper, but I was also very active in theater. And when I graduated college, I needed a job. And I thought journalism is what I think I can do and it's of interest. And so I, you know, I did the two things at once. I, while I was getting my graduate degree in playwriting, I was doing journalism, but I didn't know that I was going to be a playwright. So those things constantly affect each other. And when I was interviewing for a job at the New York Times as a news clerk, Nick Kristoff, who did hire me, he said, why should I give you this job? You're a playwright. I want to give it to a journalist who I can mentor. And I said, I totally understand that, but I think that playwriting and journalism are just two sides of the same coin. We're both looking for truth. And with journalism, you're looking at facts. This happened at five o'clock. This happened on this street. And with playwriting, you're looking for authentic truth. But that authentic truth is its own fact. And it has to, it has to be as true as in a journalist, in a news story, those facts. So one is about emotional truth and one is about uh, factual truth, this, this, this. And 
you know, that, that convinced him and, and he gave me the job. But those two things for me are very much intertwined because you're just trying to tell a story and the narrative matters. And in one, you have 700 words. And in playwriting, you have the time that it takes to, to tell the story. You know, on, on our on our past work or two workshops ago, we had uh, Peter Romano, and he said a, a, a wonderful quote, which is uh, that actors, and I guess this also translates uh, to playwrights. You know, the aim is to find truth under imagined circumstances, right? You, you know, journalism you find truth in the facts, but but playwriting you find truth in imagined circumstances. But but, yeah. but truth is what what binds us, right? Yeah. That is uh, yeah. that pursuit. Um, yeah. I'm just gonna look at this question um, that's about, it's a, it's a long one, uh, but it's about writing characters of different backgrounds from your own. Mm. So uh, for instance, the person has heard that a white person can't tell a minority story, um, but I'm sure that could be applied to any combination, i.e. Latina writer writing an Asian man story, et cetera. Uh, and then it goes on. Then again, what about empathy and representation and drive to give a platform or to tell a story of people with, I don't know what ERI stands for, different than your own, but I'm gonna assume that it's a background that is totally uh, not yours. Um, we don't have long, this, ah, ethnic racial identity. Love a good abbreviation. Um, what I will say is that the, the way that I approach this is, what is the reason that I'm going to tell a story of people that is not my story to tell? Now, I'm telling, I'm constantly telling stories that are not mine. I'm putting myself into it, but they're, they're not my story. They're someone else's story and, and, and I'm telling it. But I believe in being responsible about that. So for instance, am I writing a story in which I think I can honestly represent someone who is of whatever it is that's different than me, whether it's a man, whether it's race, whatever it is, my job is if that person is in my play, I have to go research. And I don't, if I don't know it, if it's not innate to me, if I haven't lived it or grown up with it, I have to go and research it. And that is going to look a lot of different ways. It's going to be talking to people. It's going to be doing a lot of reading, but my job is to look at something that is different for myself and see what are the stereotypes out there and make sure that I've gone way under the stereotypes so that that person is a true representation of that person, regardless of what their race or ethnicity is. And uh, the other thing I'm looking at though is, is someone from that, whatever that sort of category or demographic, are they able to tell their own story, right? And if they are able to tell their story, why should I tell one that is like it? I would rather cede the platform to people who have been marginalized and say, yeah, do this. And in, you know, in 10 or 20 years, when your story is more told and there's not a monolith about it, then maybe there's room for me. I do believe we can write stories outside of the lives that we've lived. Absolutely. And I do believe that that's a part of storytelling. The question is the moral responsibility. Should you do it? And I think you always have to ask yourself, why am I doing it? And, you know, am I doing it because I want to give parts to actors who are not normally getting parts? Am I doing it because I am hoping to get some sort of spot in a season? Uh, or am I doing it because this is a person or an issue that I cannot stop thinking about and I'm just going to have to wrestle with it. And I think that if you keep asking yourself, if you can remain in your integrity while you write a play, that's what you're trying to do. And a way to remain in your integrity is to have checks and balances set up so that you're sure that you're not either boxing people in or staying with stereotypes um, and that you are being as honest to the character and the story um, without saying, this is what all these people do. You know, you can never, you can never do it that way because of course, nobody wants to be represented as a monolith.
but you know, the, for instance, uh, stories with trans characters, who are, by trans I mean transgender, uh, most of those stories should be told by people who are trans because there hasn't been the opportunity for them to tell those stories yet. Right. So I think we, we weigh what is, uh, what is the moral obligation to have the story out there and what is the moral obligation to allow those who it's rightfully their story to tell it. And where I face this, and I, I will wrap up, is in writing in Darfur. I am not Sudanese, I am not Chadian, um, but it was a story that I saw that needed to be told. And I happened to be one of few people who at that time saw things because I was working as a journalist and because of where I was working. I had information that the public didn't yet have. And I, I wanted them to know. I wanted us to know there's a genocide happening. And I knew that they could read it in the paper that my boss at that time, Nick Kristoff, was writing about it but not many people were writing about it. And I did not think that um, a Sudanese person at that time was gonna get the platform to be able to uh, do that and explore it. And I you know, could have been wrong and I welcome anyone to tackle that subject. For me, it felt uh, time was of the essence because I wanted people to stand up and say, there is a genocide and we as a country are obligated to do something about that. So the imperative was there. If right now I was sitting and looking back on that genocide now, you know, 15 years later, which of course is still unfolding, it's still, right. the things are still true, but would I be the one to tell that story? No, I don't think so. Because there are a lot more people who are now able to be on the platform and the, the information is readily available. I'm not, I, I'm not in possession of something that is, rare or valuable. So I look at it that way and I try to weigh kind of a, a, a moral compass of how do I serve at sort of society and humanity and how do I um, stay with my own curiosity and how do I, you know, not try to uh, take what isn't mine to take and, why, and, and, and also how do I try to put myself into something so that um, the experience is as real and as genuine as I think it needs to be so that we aren't looking at something that is one dimensional or a stereotype. Thank you so much, Winter. This was outstanding. Uh, we all feel blessed for having shared a couple hours with you. Uh, it was completely enlightening. Uh, the last uh, theme that you were talking about, I think also hits very close to Miami New Drama because that is sort of, you know, we are a company that is as diverse, multicultural and multilingual as our community. Um, but we also understand uh, that, th uh, th that there, there cannot be set rules for, you know, who gets to tell the story because it's a, it's a balance. Ideally, you want all stories that are being told being told by people who live those stories closely, who are important to either they're the same, you know, it's about a specific ethnicity, it's about uh, uh, gender, it's about um, a, a nationality, etc. But the answer, I agree with you, is that things need to be put in a balance. And if somebody's doing it with the respect, with the integrity, uh, a, you know, otherwise you would only be telling stories about people like yourself. And the, the beauty of writing is that we get to, in the same way, the beauty of acting is that actors get to be many different people, uh, and so so do uh, so do writers. But especially in the world today, it's irresponsible to do it without acknowledging the great consequences of having uh, the narrative of different people being told in one way by one group of people. And if and if you can't sort of enter a story understanding all the sins that have occurred. If you don't understand the sins, then you can't tell the story, right? Yeah. But anyways, Winter, again, uh, thank you so much. We, thank you so much for, for spending time with us. This was outstanding. Um, and I can't wait to have you back. 
Uh, and also I can't wait to finally produce the show we've been working on at Miami New Drama whenever uh, those little viruses that are going around allow us to. We are, uh, until then, waiting eagerly. Uh, and thanks everybody for participating. We Thank you for participating. Weren't they amazing, Winter? Weren't they amazing? It was really exciting. I love that you all took that risk and ran with it. I just, I didn't know and I can't see your beautiful faces and I didn't know if you were at home going, you know, but, <laughs> but they did an amazing job. They were so cool. Yeah. Everybody was creative. You could see the yeah. inner world of everyone. Uh, I mean, I was so excited by hearing everyone. Thank you so yeah. much. You guys, you guys should all keep writing. <laughs> yes. And I, I will make sure that the, the prompts as they are uh, get, get sent to you. I'll send them to Jessica and Michelle now. Brilliant. So you Thank you very much, Winter Miller, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Right. Bye.